Akshay and I actually have known each other for a really long time. At this point, we started our PhDs together um, uh, way back in 2014, I think. <laughs> but yeah, so, and uh, we were working kind of in similar research groups, but Akshay was working more on the sedimentology side and I was more working more on the geochronology side. Um, but uh, yeah, so so one thing I really like about Akshay is he's got a very kind of uh, non-traditional uh, introduction to the geosciences. So he did his undergrad um, at Cornell in architecture. And then he um, uh, kind of started working for a, a, an architecture consultancy in the States. And, and uh, while working for this consultancy, they got tasked with building a serial grinding instrument where I think Akshay is going to discuss this a bit more. And I think probably he thought, what the hell is this? Uh, and But anyway, he went on to build this thing and it allowed him to reconstruct uh, um, uh, things in 3D. It's, well, essentially rocks, rocks that you're able to grind into dust and, and, and take progressive photographs. Uh, he was able to reconstruct these in 3D using uh, machine learning in some parts of that. Uh, but but uh, but yeah, that was kind of his introduction to the geosciences, and then he was asked to basically come and start to use this new instrument to uh, work on various um, things in the sediment sedimentological record. Uh, so yeah, so uh, um, and then the other funny thing is, me and actually both defended our PhDs within a week of each other, and uh, and then he went on to do a postdoc at Dartmouth, and he's recently started uh, uh, a faculty position at the University of Washington and where he's going to continue to kind of integrate uh, big data, sedimentology, earth history and machine learning. So if he, yeah, if he, so he's got five or six years now and then, uh, if he gets 10 years, he'll continue. Uh, okay, so with that, okay, thanks very much and uh, uh, go ahead and I think your mask, your Laser pointer should be working, and yeah, awesome. Well, we, right, well can, we can we we can see your mouse. You can or you cannot. Uh, I can. Okay, awesome, perfect. Okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you all for inviting me to come speak. I'm really excited. As Scott says, um, yeah, we go back to 2014. We were grad school roommates for a very long time, um, and I've learned a lot from Scott and and a lot of the geochronology that he's done and thinking about timing in earth history. And as Scott mentioned, I've thought a lot about um, geobiology and sedimentology. And so today I'm going to share some of these uh, insights that I've developed over the years with you. So broadly speaking, I am a sedimentologist and a geobiologist. My goal is to improve our understanding of the evolution of life and environment on our planet. And to do so, I use a variety of quantitative computational and spatial analyses. And so generally I work on multiple levels. So I might be looking at micron to centimeter scale uh, ediacaran organisms. So fossils of things that lived 540 million years ago. I might be thinking about large scale meter to kilometer scale um, reef geometries. And then I've worked on a few projects where I'm really thinking about data sets that span all of Earth's history and cover the entire globe, however imperfectly. So I don't have time to talk about all of these projects and I'm happy to talk about, especially the center one in more detail if you're interested. But today I'm going to really be telling you about stuff that, that, are, that sits on either side of these lens scales. We're gonna begin with analyzing enigmatic ediacaran organisms. As Scott mentioned, this is a lot of the work I did during my PhD, it, it's continued um, and now I'm interested in very specific parts of these enigmatic organisms. I'd like to begin with this intro slide, which is a photograph taken on Salian Mountain in the Canadian Rockies. This was taken in 2015, I believe. And what I've done is I've drawn a yellow line through the center of this image. What that yellow line does is it separates the background from the foreground. In the background, we have a glacier that's retreating. And as that glacier is retreated, it's exposed what you see in the foreground. Uh, the foreground are stromatolite bioherms. So these are just microbially mediated uh, laminated sedimentary structures. And if you go and look inside these structures, 
uh, in the layer, between the layers, what you'll see are tiny little fossils. And those are what people think are Earth's first uh, biomineralizing organisms. But before we actually get into those organisms, I want to point out the broader question I'm, I'm after when I study these things. So for most of Earth's history, reefs have been made up of microbial constructions. What I'm showing you on the right is a modern day stromatolite from Shark Bay in Australia. But really, for most of our planet's past, these microbes have been dominant in shallow water reef settings. At some point in time, and exactly when is a bit uh, unknown still, calcifying metazoans or animals that build shells began to build what are known as framework reefs. And these framework reefs are different from the microbial reefs that they that, that preceded them because these framework reefs have high topographic relief. They have a great deal of what's known as structural complexity, and they can grow in places where microbes simply can't. They can grow in high energy environments because you're building up a wave resistant structure. And two major questions I'm after, and, and this is work that will continue for many years. Uh, the first question is, when did metazoan framework reefs first emerge on our planet? And because when we look at things like modern day coral reefs, which are framework reefs, and we see the, the structural complexities and we recognize them as hotspots of biodiversity, one other question I have here is what were the environmental and evolutionary impacts such that are the nooks and crannies that make up modern day framework reefs also responsible for the sort of evolutionary diversification event that we saw during the early Cambrian? To answer that question, we have to understand exactly when frameworks actually emerged on our planet. And generally, it's accepted that Earth's first framework reefs showed up during what's known as a Cambrian radiation about 540 million years ago. Here on the left-hand side, I'm just showing you a time scale going from 4.5 billion years ago to the present. And I'm just zooming in on the time period between the Ediacaran to Cambrian. It's at this, trans it's at this boundary and, and beyond that we actually start to see Earth's first ecosystem engineers. And when I talk about ecosystem engineering, I really mean we have animals that are now starting to burrow underneath and, and basically churn through sediment, release elements. They're also building upwards. And so you can see this all from this reconstruction from 1979 by Conway Morris and Whittington. This is a reconstruction of the Burgess Shale uh, as it may have looked before it became buried. And among these ecosystem engineers were what we consider to be Earth's first framework reef builders. These are the archaeocyathid sponges Archaeocyathid sponges or calcareous sponges. And here's a reconstruction from Rachel Wood's 1999 book on reefs. And what I especially love about this reconstruction is that it shows a lot of the features that I've been talking about. They're the nooks and crannies that I've talked about, the structural complexity. They're these large void spaces in which other organisms might live. But there's also a great deal of topographic relief here. And, and so really, it's more or less undisputed that the archaeocytes were building a sort of framework reef. And, and the relative contributions of the, the large-scale metazones versus the smaller things that made the reefs, that the, the, the calcifying um, cyanobacteria, for example, that's still, those are still open questions. But broadly, it's accepted that Earth's first framework reef builders emerged during the Cambrian. Now, one question we might ask is, are there biomineralizers that existed before the Cambrian? And if so, were they, were they capable of building reefs? And often what I do is I actually walk through 4.5 billion years of life on our planet and the, the history of life on our planet to demonstrate that really the Ediacaran is the only time period in, in Earth's deep time past that we actually might find organisms that are capable of building reefs. Uh, and those are three or four genera known as the Ediacaran biomineralizers. We have Namakalathus on the left here. We have Clydina in the center. Then we have Namapogi on the right. Uh, all three of these were first described in Namibia. Um, and so they really do have a, um, a, a long history of study within the African continent. And I'm after a set of very specific questions. First, what were these organisms? Were they actually building shells? And that will become important in a little bit. And then more importantly, for the question that I'm after, were any of them actually building framework reefs? What I'm gonna posit here is that comparative morphological analyses and specifically those that we do in three dimensions can help answer these questions in a way that two dimensional analyses simply cannot. And 
to make this case, I'm actually going to turn to uh, to something that happened at the turn of the 19th century into the 20th century. That was when William Solace, who was a who at the time was a, a professor of geology at Oxford, presented a paper at the Royal Society, and Solace basically lamented. Saw said that paleontologists might perhaps be excused if they regarded with a certain degree of envy the students of recent organisms, who has at his command investigation by means of serial sections. And what Salas was talking about when he's talking about these investigations by serial sections was the fact that if you're looking at something that is made up of soft tissues, like, for example, this rat brain, you can take a knife, you can sharpen it, and then you can just take very, very thin slices of that tissue. And you can take successive thin sections of that tissue. It's really easy to do. What you can do is then lay out those, uh, those sections like you're seeing here. And then you can understand the three-dimensional relationships of different features within this brain, for example, or without, within whatever you're studying. Now, as geologists, we know that that's actually really hard to do if we're thinking about rocks, right? So there is no knife that we can sharpen to just slice rocks really thinly. We can grind them but then we lose a lot of the successive nature, right? And I want to point out that Solace's lament wasn't just hyperbole. It, you know, it sounds like he's saying, oh, we're missing so much of the information that we could get. He's saying we're missing 90% of the data that we might be able to get out of these fossils if we're just able to see them in serial sections. And to make this case to you, I'm actually going to show you a little case study. This is Ryan Manzik. He's currently a PhD student uh, in my old lab at Princeton, um, working under Adam Maloof, who's my advisor. And Ryan's been studying archaeocyathids uh, since he started his PhD. He and I went out to Nevada to what is one of these classic localities of archaeocyathid reefs. And we looked around for examples of, of these organisms. What you can see in this photograph is a, is a bedding plane photograph of a set of archaeocyathids. And I apologize for the blurriness of the photo. But generally, if, if you're someone who studies these sponges, and even if you're not, you could very quickly draw out you know, a handful of these individuals. You can draw little boundaries around them. They're pretty easy to see. They're the, the dark gray uh, um, features on this rock. If your eye is especially good, or you've been doing this for a long time, you might start to notice things like this branching example here, which I've highlighted in yellow. But what you would miss if you, all you had access to were these two dimensional cross sections is the sort of density and complexity that's actually inherent within these organisms. And so here I'm actually gonna show you a video. This is a video of archaeocyathids that were taken from the same locality. And then when we actually build a three dimensional model of them, you see all that structural complexity I talked about. You see their density, you see their branching angles, and Ryan's had a lot of success actually measuring these branching angles to understand what they tell us about water flow around these organisms. And then to go one step further and say what that means for the way that these organisms lived and how they might be related to, uh, how all that might be related to reef building. So I think there's a lot of power in 3D that we just miss when all we have is a random 2D cross section through a sample. And indeed, people have described this before and I've done some of this work as well, which is, to show that there are 3D properties that cannot accurately be estimated from single 2D sections. And those properties include things like shape and size, chemical co composition and orientation, they include things like permeability and density, as well as connectivity. The point to make here isn't that we have to throw out all 2D sections because we all work on two dimensional uh, thin sections. I myself do, I know you, a lot of you in the room might do as well. But what I wanna point out is that the errors of these 2D measurements vary in magnitude and sometimes may not be tractable. So what I'm showing you here is from a paper uh, that I put out last year in which I actually just build synthetic examples of things that I'm interested in imaging. So in the top left, I'm looking at tubular organisms. These are synthetic models that I've built. I've just produced them in 3D modeling software. On the lower left is a granular material. On the top right is a crystalline solid, such as what might, you might find in a granite. And on the bottom right is just a single crystal. So if you're interested in just understanding pseudomorphs over time, how wrong can you be? And what I do with these synthetic sections is I just slice them up and I try to understand if we take 
a random section through these or we take an oriented section through these, how big is our error in whatever we're interested in measuring? So if we're interested in measuring, for example, the symmetry within an individual crystal, turns out you can be pretty wrong. But if you're interested in understanding the porosity of a granular material on the left side here, in fact, you're probably two or 3% wrong, which is totally acceptable given some of the questions that you might be interested in, in answering. And so the point here isn't to throw out two-dimensional analyses, it's to recognize the uncertainties and errors associated with those analyses, and then to quantify them and decide whether you actually need to move in 3D or whether that sort of magnitude of error is small enough that you can safely ignore. Okay, so that's on 3D properties, but we're gonna go back to Solace. When Solace was done lamenting in, in 1903, he built this machine. This is uh, the first serial grinder and imager. The way it works is you take a sample and you put it in P over here. P is just a little holder. You put some grit on D over here, and then you have a grad student just turn that wheel until you've ground away some amount of material. You can take that sample off and then you can photograph it or trace that newly freshly grabbed surface. You put the sample back on, you grind away a little bit more material and you continue to do so until you've destroyed that sample. But what you end up with is a set of successive sections. And Solace had a lot of success working with these sections. So here are two examples of what he and his daughter, Gerna, who was the first woman to study geology at Oxford, what these two put together. So on the left, they've taken a fossil and they've put together the, the successive sections and they've been able to create a 3D draw or a, a projected drawing of those sections. And then on the right-hand side, they've actually built a model out of wax, basically taking each one of these traces and then cutting it out of a layer of wax of the thickness of the material that they receive, of they, they removed, and then stacking those layers together. And I especially love in, in four here in the top right, where you can actually see how those successive sections go together. And if you're interested, this is actually a fossil of a brittle star, which I know very little about, but these reconstructions are absolutely amazing. And what else I love about these reconstructions that is that these are analog forms of the sort of work that I do now. And so we really can trace the work that I do now all the way back to Solace and his daughter. So for many of you in the room, you might be saying, okay, well, what Solace is doing, maybe that's great, but we know that we have X-ray CT now and X-ray CT can handle all of these problems without me destroying the sample. And indeed, what I'm showing you here is just a simple example of X-ray CT where what we do is we have a sample, we pass an X-ray beam through it. We have a, a detector and it takes a single projection. We then take multiple projections and then using inverse methods, we might be able to reconstruct what is inside that sample. This last step, this process data step requires inverse methodologies, which means that we really are trying to understand how those X-rays are being attenuated and then backing out what may have attenuated those X-rays. Ultimately, these methods rely on material and density contrast. So here on the top, I'm showing you examples of images that were taken of samples with just a regular camera. So we have an oolite on the left. And so oolites are just made up of ooids, which are concentric carbonate grains. We have granites in the center, and then we have carbonates on the right. This is actually an example of a cloudina. You can see the shell here in white, and then in black, we have a bunch of micrite. In gold, we have some dolomite. So in all three of these cases, it's pretty easy to see the sort of features we're after. Now, when we take these images and we put them under X-ray CT, we get various, uh, we get results of various success. On the leftmost side, we can make out each of these individual ooids perfectly because the density of the air is completely different than the density of the ooids. Great. Once we get into the granites, we have a bit of a problem because it turns out that quartz and the feldspars actually share similar densities. So we lose a lot of the contrast that we need to tell different phases apart. The mafic elements, these, these dark elements, we're just quantifying everything as a mafic element. Those still appear because they do have different densities than the quartz and the feldspars. By the time we get into a rock that's made up of all carbonate, so the fossil is carbonate, the dolomite is a form of carbonate, the micrite is a carbonate, we lose basically all abilities to see contrast. And indeed, when we're in situations where we have no material or density contrast, we need to find another way to image and reconstruct samples. 
And that's where the serial grinding and imaging machine comes in. This was a machine, as Scott mentioned, I started working on back in 2012, 2013. And what it comprises is a CNC surface grinder, which you can see here. For some reason, my label's missing. And then what we have is an 80 megapixel digital camera that's up here. And what ends up happening is you take a sample and we start to grind that sample. We mount it on a steel plate and we remove some amount of material. This happens automatically because it's a CNC machine. Once we've ground away, say, about 30 microns of material, so a human hair is about 50 microns, what we can do is that sample moves underneath that 80 megapixel digital camera, and we take a photograph. We repeat time and time again until we've destroyed the sample. All we're left with is a stack of high-resolution images. And so when we first built this machine, we had an 80 megapixel camera. Now we have a 150 megapixel camera on there. But essentially what we're building are very, very high-resolution image stacks. I write machine learning uh, methods to isolate the features of interest in those images so that we can take the stack of images and just like Solis did more than 100 years ago, build three-dimensional models from those cross sections. I wanna point out that this work doesn't just involve uh, fossils. So I've largely worked on reconstructing things that exist in carbonate rocks, but I have worked on other samples. So for example, working with Isla Pamukchi, who's at Stanford and Michael Eddy, who's at Purdue University, We've been looking at granites from the Golden Horn Pluton or the Golden Horn Batholith uh, up here in the Cascades in Washington. And here I'm just showing you a single sample made up of those four phases we had mentioned before, two feldspars, a quartz, and some mafic elements. What you can see here are these reconstructions of this granite. We've been able to basically, using just true color imagery, identify different mineral phases within this granite and then build this 3D reconstruction. We can go one step further actually, and we can compare the modal mineralogy that we extract from our digital model. So having no information about what makes up this granite, and then compare that to whole rock data. So here you're just looking at two feldspars and, and quartz up here. You can see where the whole rock data plot, you can see where our purely digital estimate of what the modal mineralogy should be plots as well. So we're within five to 10% of something that really requires you to take a kilogram of rock, crush it up, and then do these analyses. So I think these sort of methods are incredibly promising. And, and Scott and I have talked about different ways that we might approach open questions that some of you are thinking about using uh, 3D reconstruction such as this one. But okay, we're gonna go back to the EDI computed and biomineralizers because really that's what I started this talk with and that's where I really wanna get to. I can tell you almost off the bat that Namakalathus, which was reconstructed by John Gratzinger and, and Wes Waters in 2000, is a goblet-like organism that is very flexible. It bends over really easily. Indeed, if you see it in the field, you find it sort of just bent over, living and as solitary uh, individuals. And so we know Namakalathus cannot be building a reef. And in fact, we don't even know to what degree it was biomineralized. So then we move on to Claudina. And so here's a bedding plane image of Claudina, as I've shown before. And Claudina are these tubular organisms. You might make out some tubes in this image right here. And in 2014, Amelia Penny and Rachel Wood and others made some two-dimensional observations of the orientation of these tubes. And then combining that with evidence of in-situ cementation suggested that Claudina was actually building framework reefs that these tubes were oriented in a specific direction because they were preferentially uh, aiming in one, one path so that they could feed. So this is a totally testable hypothesis. We can go out, we can make these 3D reconstructions. We can look at multiple 3D reconstructions over multiple reef systems. And we can try to see if we see examples of, of both cementation, but also of a preferential orientation such that we know these things are growing in situ, and then we can extrapolate from there and say they likely are building these large calcifying bioherms. So to do these reconstructions, we have to go out. This is me as a second year graduate student. In the foreground is uh, Adrian Cicero Hart, who's currently a PhD student at the University of Santa Barbara with Francis McDonald. We're out in Namibia, this is Zebra River Farm, and we're just trying to find uh, some of these Claudina-bearing reefs. 
We also went up into the Canadian Rockies. So this is a exam this is a photograph from Salient Mountain in the Canadian Rockies. You can see this pink bioherm in the foreground where the rock hammer is. So as I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk, if you walk into or walk right up onto these rocks, what you'll see are things like this. You'll see all of this fossil hash. So everything in white here is a fossil for the most part. They're called Dynanomacolathus. So both of these organisms actually exist here. And as I mentioned before, Claudina is essentially a tubular organism that comprises cup and cup uh, structures. And so here's just an individual Claudina tube reconstructed coming from one of these rocks that I'm showing you here. So we don't just do single uh, tube reconstructions. Using Geary, we can build these full reconstructions of the entire model. And so that's what you're seeing here of, of an aggregate of Claudina. And so this is from Zebra River Farm. This is one of the places where you might expect to find these things growing in fitu. What might pop out to you almost immediately is that there doesn't seem to be a preferential orientation. Indeed, it actually looks like everything is being washed into place. And no matter where we went, no matter which sort of uh, collection we looked at, whichever aggregate we saw, it always looked like what we were looking at were piles of detritus. We can go one step further though, because we have three-dimensional uh, or the ability to measure three-dimensional uh, morphology here. And one thing we looked at was the, was the aspect ratio of the cross-section. So we're interested in whether or not these cross-sections are perfectly circular. And in fact, if they were all perfectly circular, we would see them plot on this one-to-one -one line up here. If they're very elliptical, we'd see them on the 0.5 to one line, right? That means that one of the axes is much shorter than the other. What you actually see here is that almost none of these tubes, save for some of the smallest ones, really have circular cross sections. We can go one step further and actually look at the orientation of these uh, semi-minor axes. And we can see if they're all oriented in the same direction and understand whether that ellipticity is actually the result of burial, right? So if everything got buried, we should expect that the orientation of that short axis, they all should be oriented the same way. Well, in fact, none of them are oriented the same way. And really what that tells us is these things were being deformed as they were being washed into place. So not only are they not in situ, these things lack the sort of structural rigidity we would expect of something that might be building a framework. And after having uh, done this work, we, we, we set out to look for something that might be similar to Clydina to understand how it may have grown and what an, a good analog would be. And Adam was walking along by Dune Duplat up in, uh, in, in France with, with students one time, and he walked by these circulate worm tubes. And we had talked a lot about circulate bioherms and how circulates, a lot of circulates tend to agglutinate their, skeleton, their shells. So they're basically using things to stick grains together. And Adam saw this example and we we're like, oh, this, this is a good analog for what we're thinking Cloud Dino was doing. So if you were to walk up to one of these tubes and squeeze them between your hands, they would just fall apart. And yet there are tubes and there is a degree of biomerization here. So we proposed an analid affinity for Claudina and that's as far as we could get to because all we had were the external shells, right? But, oh, sorry, this tends to happen. Give me a sec. All right, sorry about that. But basically in 2020, Jim Schiffbauer and others happened to find an example of a preserved gut in one of these Claudina. And you know, this is work that was done with X-ray CT. So this is another good example of how these different imaging modalities are actually complementary. They are not in contrast with each other, right? We might be able to say something about large scale aggregates because we can look at them as they're preserved as carbonates in carbonate rock. But Jim can see things such as pyrotized examples of Claudina and can find examples of things such as these uh, beautiful guts within these organisms. And so that finding confirmed a bilateral affinity for Claudina. So I think this really demonstrates the power of the sort of work that we're doing, which is all we're looking at are the remnants, the shelly remnants of an organism. We don't have any soft body parts, at least when we're looking at the things that are preserved in carbonate rock. And we're able to make a call that then can be tested and then can be shown to be true. So I think there is a very nice feedback of the way that science should work, really.
Okay, great. So Claudida is an easily deformable, weakly biomineralized organism. So what about Namapoikia? Now, Namapoikia is interesting because people think that Namapoikia was an early sponge. And if you remember, I told you that the Archaeocyathids were early sponges. So is Namapoikia an ediacaran sponge? And if so, was it building the reefs in which it's found? The first thing we can do is actually go look for examples of, of Namapoikia. And so here, what we're doing is we're at Drina Vlakta Farm in, in Namibia. The dip is to the, to the south uh, east here, about 45 degrees. So you're looking at a bleak cut through the reef. And what we've done is we've gone out and we've measured every 10 meters, we've taken a survey point. And we've observed the sort of uh, textures and features that we see at each one of these survey points. So we end up with something like 1,200 survey points. Then we're using basic creating methods. We can just look to see whether we have a, what the probability of finding uh, Nama Poikia is in different parts of the reef. So a probability of one means that it's definitively there. A uh, probability of zero means that there's nothing to be found. And so what you can see is Nama Poikia does occur in a handful of places across the reef system, but really it's only found in these small cracks known as Neptunian dikes. Well, sorry, they're large cracks known as Neptunian dikes, uh, but otherwise they're not really ubiquitous through the reef system. Another issue here is that Nama Poikia is only found in one reef system in the world, so only at Drina Vlakta Farm. So it's definitively not a large component of Ediacaran reef systems, and it's definitely not building this reef. But now we can still ask, was it a sponge? And to explain to you why sponges are such a big deal, or finding an early example of a sponge is such a big deal, I'm going to just turn to this record of Precambrian sponge fossils. So these might be spicules, they might be body fossils. In any case, each one of these is plotted here. These are papers in which someone says, oh, I have found a sponge example. These are all Precambrian. And the, they're plotted as to where they're found in the time scale. The point to make here is that not a single one of these records is in, undisputed. Someone disagrees with every single one of these records. And the sponge debate, the Precambrian sponge debate is continuing even today. So this is a recent paper by Liz Turner, where she describes these sponge textures up in the Little Doll reefs. And this is a tantalizing paper because these are very old reefs, right? They're, they, um, they go even further back in time than the Ediacaran. And People are still debating, are sponges basically growing alongside these uh, microbial constructions? Are they sort of a cryptic uh, uh, inhabitant of these reef systems going all the way back to, one, uh, to a billion years ago? So these are all open questions. Finding a, a definitive example of an, of an Ediacaran or a Precambrian sponge is a very, very big deal. And so, we went out to find out whether Nama Poikia is a sponge. We know it's not a framework reef builder, but was it a very early calcareous sponge? Here's an image of Nama Poikia as you might see it in the field. What you might pick up are these sort of labyrinthian textures, right? So the, the fossils in white here. And it does look like there's a lot of order in, in the Nama Poikia. If we start to compare Nama Poikia's cross section, so if we're looking at a transverse cross section, so we've just taken something and cut the top and just looked down, and we compare it to something, for example, like a, a Permian sponge, a calcareous Permian sponge on the left, a perforata, we start to see some similarities. We look on the right, this is a longitudinal section through Namapoika and a perforata. These two look similar, right? The, the fossils in white, the void spaces are in black. They're tantalizingly similar. One thing I wanna draw your attention to is the scale bar here, right? So this is one millimeter in Namapoika. This is one millimeter in a perforata. Now we'll put you as much larger than anything that we see in the rock record. So that's a knock against it being a sponge because the way that sponges work, they really are made up of these tiny micron scale uh, cells known as choanocytes. Those things beat and as they beat, they move water through canal systems. Those choanocytes never get larger. So canals never get larger. The sponges just build more and more canals, more and more chambers in which those choanocytes can live, sorry. Okay, but how would Nama Poikia have lived and how can we test this hypothesis? Well, here's an example from 2018 where authors put out that Nama Poikia is uh, 
was likely growing like this. And I'm just going to walk you through this reconstruction. So on the base, we have some sort of thrombolytic or stromatolytic uh, substrate. Now Mopoikia is growing outward. So these are the, the elements that are growing out of the sponge. I'm going to label those partitions. These partitions are cross-cut by these horizontal uh, structural systems or structural elements known as tabulae or what I'm calling tabulae. And the sponge itself actually grows at the very top of, of this uh, reconstruction. What happens is as the sponge grows upwards, it evacuates its lower chambers. These lower chambers should fill up with a bunch of cement. These lower partitions should actually get over thickened. And so this is the hypothesized mode of growth for Namapoikia. We can ask if that morphology is in fact indicative of a sponge affinity and whether or not we can affirm this growth habit from three-dimensional reconstructions. And so I'm just gonna, in the interest of time today, show you a single reconstruction of Namapoikia that we've done. We've done multiple. We've demonstrated quantitatively that actually Namapoikia is way too large to be a sponge. We've demonstrated that its partitions don't actually thicken as they go from the lower part to the upper part, suggesting that part of the reconstruction is incorrect. And what you can see here from the 3D reconstruction is that there are no tabulae to speak of. It's not like we're looking at chambers that were growing upwards, right? I'm even pointing out where stratigraphic up is. And so this is the direction in which the sponge should be growing upwards from some substrate. And as I cut through this reconstruction, what you can tell is that while we might have some fractures going through the system, what we do not have are tabulates in 3D. Indeed, what we're looking at is a structure that's made up of these sheets and these sheets coalesce. So they merge and they break apart, they merge and they break apart. And that's not like a sponge at all. That's not like any metazoan we see. In fact, we're gonna propose that Namapoikia was more like a microbial construction. And so this is F. Cooperi, it's a Cambrian thrombolite described by Russell Shapiro and his advisor in 2006. Here are just some thick sections that, that Russell did through this, uh, through this example. He was very kind enough to actually send us a sample of F. Cooperi so that we could do this comparison work. And so here you can see a reconstruction of F. Cooperi. You can see that it is also made up of sheets, just like Namapoikia was. The scale bar, Namapoik is too big to be a sponge. It's too small to be F. Cooperi because F. Cooperi is massive. But what you can see in this reconstruction are examples of splitting and merging, splitting and merging. And I can't tell you which direction up is in here. We just know uh, what the general orientation of the sample is. So that's why I'm saying it's splitting and merging because I don't really have a story about whether they're growing together and it's breaking apart or vice versa. In any case, we are going to argue that F. Cooperi or a microbial construction such as, such as F. Cooperi serves as a much better analog for Namapoikia than a sponge would. And indeed, something I've become very, very interested in, I have a student working on currently, are questions about how microbial mediated constructions, so things such as stromatolites or thrombolites, can build structures that appear to have a great deal of order to them. And so here I'm just showing you a, a, a figure from Paul Hoffman's 1974 paper in the Great Slave Lake, where he went around and looked at these stromatolites and showed how their morphology varied based on where you were within uh, the regional setting. And we know that microbes respond to environmental forcings and they respond to uh, physical forcings as well as to biological forcing and produce totally different morphological forms. What we don't have a good understanding of is how those different morphological forms link back to biological or environmental forcings. And that's one of the focus, one of the things that my lab focuses on. Great, so I'm gonna to return to putative biomineralizers for a minute. I'm going to tell you that none of these things were building reefs. These things are questionably metazoan in the case of Namapoikia and questionably biomineralizing in the case of Claudina. And so really we're left with the archaeocyathids during the Cambrian. But the one thing I'm very, very, very open to is maybe something will come along to prove us wrong. Maybe new discoveries will tell us that in fact, there is a early metazone reef record that we've just missed because maybe it was cryptic. And so I look forward to those kinds of discoveries. Okay, great. In the next 10 minutes of this talk, uh, as I wrap up, I really wanna get in to something that's totally different, has nothing to do with 3D at all, but 
but sort of demonstrated the kind of computational work that I do on a very different scale and with a very different kind of data. And that are that's a project involving large data sets of sedimentary geochemistry. Where I'm gonna start off this project is with a statement that I hope is completely uncontroversial. And that's that large data compilations are not new to the earth, ocean, and space sciences. This is a set of spindle diagrams from 1858 that Braun put together. Essentially, Braun had assembled tables where he described individual organisms and their occurrences. And then he was able to demonstrate how the abundance of these organisms changed through time by just taking his tables and turning them into a graphical format. And when we talk about large data compilations, all I mean is that we have a set of uh, samples or things that we're interested in, and each one of those things has a set of uh, parameters associated with it. So it might be age, it might be number of occurrences, it might be size. So that's all I mean by large data compilations. And Braun wasn't the only one working on this. So this is from uh, Philip's 1860 book. So this was published around the time that Origin of Species came out. And all we're seeing are successive systems of marine invertebrates through time. And Phillips is able to do this in 1860, right? So without computation, just compiling descriptions that other people have put forward of different fossils. Phillips went one step further in this book and actually generated this uh, trend line of diversity through time, organismal diversity through time. And was able to actually break this up into three different fauna, which we recognize today. And what you can see in Philip's example from 1860 are the sort of diversification extinction events that we recognize today. And in fact, back in 1860, people thought that these sort of large drops were not the function of, of actual extinctions, but were just a function of missing data. The point I want to make here is that large data compilations, however imperfect, can still provide meaningful insights, especially on the growth scale. And so we should really rely on that. And in fact, this is work that was done in 1860. Many of you in the room might be familiar, familiar with Sapkowski's curves, the, the first one that came out in 1982. And Sapkowski's curves show us the same sort of general pattern of fauna and as well as of extinctions and radiations. And I pur purposefully picked Sapkowski's 1992 paper to demonstrate uh, some of this work, because what Sapkowski does in this paper is actually show you how, after a much more data were added to the data set he was working with, the trends he showed in 1982 did not appreciably change. So even as you get more and more occurrences of specific species or genera or families, you don't see that change occurring within the, in the record. And so we should really rely on these large data sets. But we also, need to, uh, we also need to basically acknowledge that such data sets inherently contain a whole set of biases and uncertainties. And everything I'm gonna show you from this moment on are data from the Sedimentary Geochemistry and Paleo Environments Project, which is spearheaded by Eric Sperling at Stanford among others. And really, this is a collection of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of geochemical analytes specifically associated with sedimentary geochemistry. And the first thing you might notice here is that a lot of that data base comes from North America. So we have spatial biases. Here, I'm going to show you that there are also temporal biases within that record. So I'm showing you uh, the relative age uncertainty of samples coming from three different sources that make up the SGP. On the left, we have contributions by co-authors and collaborators. In the middle, we have data that come from the USGS Critical Metal and Black Shales database. And then the, on the right, we have data that come from the USGS uh, National Geochemical Database. As you can tell, the age uncertainty varies greatly. And part of the reason here is because some of these USGS samples come from you know, things that were done in the 1980s. But we don't want to just throw out things because we have these uncertainties. Another thing that you might be familiar with, especially if you've ever measured something uh, on a mass spec, is that we have analytical uncertainties as well, right? All I'm showing you here are samples that have two aluminum values reported in the SGP. So they have aluminum from aluminum oxide, and they also have aluminum from weight percent. Stuff that plots on the one-to-one -one line just means that we actually that somewhere in the database, 
or somewhere someone took a sample and converted one into the other. But we also have a whole bunch of spread here, and that means that we actually have two different methods of generating estimates of aluminum in a sample. And the deviation from this one-to-one -one line tells us that that is analytical uncertainty that we have to account for, right? That basically means that we're not sure what the exact value of the aluminum is in, in a given sample. And anyone who's worked with analytical data knows this to be true. So the ultimate question that we're after then is, is it possible to faithfully generate global records of whatever we're interested in, long time trends of whatever we're interested in, using such data sets? So here I'm just showing you aluminum oxide content in the SGP for the last 850 million years. And I'm asking, can I draw a line through here to understand what is happening to aluminum in sedimentary rocks through time? I'm going to propose that yes, it is possible, but only through careful data analysis. And this data analysis requires a set of steps. It's almost like a recipe. And so in 2021, I, along with a whole bunch of co-authors, put out a paper in GSA Today to talk about what this workflow might look like. So we're going to begin with some aggregated data that comes in a database. Now, a database could be your Excel spreadsheet of a thousand records that you've compiled. It could be something like the SGP. It could be data that you've scraped using a large language model. You asked a very basic question of, do we, have, do we want to do all of our analyses in the database? Sometimes you can do that, especially if you're skilled at SQL. Or do I want to extract that data into a new format and use some other method, maybe Excel or MATLAB or whatever it might be, Python. We extract that data, and then we ask a very, very important question. Are all the data that we're looking at pertinent to the question at hand? And I'm going to argue they almost certainly are not. So we need to filter by a set of parameters parameters that we choose based on the question that we're after. We also have to ask whether we're going to remove outliers. And this is an important step because sometimes outliers are really critical. They tell us about some weird thing that's going on, but still is a function of whatever we're studying. Other times, such as in the case of the critical metal in Black Shales database, they're really telling us about something that has economic value, but tells us nothing about processes that might affect sedimentary uh, conditions. Okay, once we've done all of that, we have our filtered data. We then do a step known as bootstrap resampling. I'm not gonna go into much detail here in the interest of time, but we will, I'm more than happy to talk about it. I also have a proxy primer talk that I've done for the SGP. It's on YouTube, I'm more than happy to share that link. Finally, we end up with resampled data that then we can statistically analyze and generate a meaningful time trend here. So to demonstrate how this workflow uh, operates, what I'm going to do is just show you how we basically applied it to a very specific set of questions. So we were interested in how the sedimentary record of just mudstones looks like or changes through Earth history. And then how do those trends that form us of relationships between tectonics, weathering processes, and provenance? This is a paper that's in review that we're still modifying. So I'm not really going to get to the second part of the question, but I'm much more than happy to talk about it if you're interested. Okay. So the first step we do is our multi-step filtering. So, you know, we're looking at mudstone, so we don't want carbonates. And so one thing we can do is just look at the, the parameters. So we can look at the entry for a specific sample and say, oh, is this classified as a carbonate? Throw it out. But we can also use strategic concentration cutoffs. So we can look at calcium levels, for example, and say, oh, if we have too high of a calcium level here, this is technically a carbonate. Let's throw it out again. And so what we end up doing between that and then looking at a bunch of outlier data is we reduce SGP to a mudstones only data set. So we take 82,000 samples that were in the original SGP and we end up reducing them down to 9,406. We're no longer dealing with big data at all or moderate data or even small data. We're looking at a very small data set. But I'm actually very happy with doing so because now I know we're only answering the question about whether or not, uh, or whether something was happening to mudstones. Uh, through Earth history. We then handle uncertainty and heterogeneity in our data set by using what's known as a weighted bootstrap resampling. This is not a complicated uh, concept once we actually go through it, but it, it, is, it can be a bit um, uh, scary. I, I always was a bit confused until I actually walked through each of the steps. I'm more than happy to do that for anyone if you're interested. But in any case, what we're doing with weighted bootstrap resampling is we're basically deciding 
to weight samples that are together and give them lower weights than samples that are far apart. Because the idea is that if samples are together, they're really just telling you about something that happened in one place in time and space. But what we're really interested in is what is happening globally over time. And so we don't want to just make our resample data set a collection of things that all happened in one location at one time period, right? That doesn't actually get us to the, the questions that we're after. And then we're not really then pushing our uncertainty measures forward. So what I'm showing you on the right is a really simple inverse distance weighting uh, setup. And we can go into more detail about how this works if you're interested. But essentially what we do is we take some sample X, we take a second sample X sub I, and we calculate a distance between them. So that distance could be their distance in space, their distance in time, maybe how different their geochemical analyte measurements are. We then put that, we, we take one and we divide it over that distance. That's where the inverse distance comes from. And then we come up with a weight for, for this pair of samples. We can do this over and over and we can actually come up with a summed weight where we can look at one sample and its distance from every other sample in the data set. And then remember, we're penalizing things that are close together in time and space, and we're trying to resample things that are far away. Now we run into a problem here because we have to decide what is far and what is close in, in, when we're thinking about inverse distance, right? What is, a, what, are two, what is a far sample when we think about space? Are two samples that are in the same basin uh, close enough? Are they, if they're in two different basins, are we gonna do it by degrees latitude? Well, one thing we might look at if we're thinking about sedimentary basins are the characteristic length and age scale for a depositional basin. And unfortunately, it turns out that there is no single characteristic length and age scale for depositional basins. And, and I'm sure many in the room already know this. This is from Woodcock et al. in 2004. And so you can see that not only do you have lifespans that, order, that span multiple orders of magnitude, but as you can imagine, you have land scales that span orders of magnitude. So it becomes really hard to pick some scaling term where we're like, yes, this is a characteristic basin length. And so samples that are closer than this characteristic basin length should be grouped together and samples that are far away should be different. Well, one thing we did was actually test whether it matters. And we did a sensitivity analysis and we basically said, does it make a difference whether we pick a, a spatial scale that is very big or very small? And what I'm showing you are 625 simulations looking at uranium through time. And what you notice here is that no matter what simulation you do, no matter what combination of spatial and temporal scale you choose, whether it's very small or very large, you end up with essentially the same mean uh, trend through time. And so it turns out that spatial and temporal scales don't matter that much. And I'm more than happy to get into details about why that might be. But I'm just gonna walk you through a case study really, really quickly and then wrap this up. Essentially, let's look at uranium through time. We know uranium is a redox sensitive element. This is the record as it exists in the SGP color coded by at what point we've re re filtered it out of the data set. So red are things that, well, they got filtered out once the lithology just didn't match mudstones, all the way to stuff that we filtered out because they were outliers and they were, they were samples that were maybe good for economic geology, but not for sedimentary basin development. And so we take this, we apply our bootstrap uh, resampling method. And what we see is a trend where we start to see an increase in uranium. And remember, it's a redox sensitive element that corresponds to increase in oxygenation as we should expect. And so this is a really tantalizing trend. It is confirmed by other things in the rock record. So we can actually say, yes, it appears that this method is working rather well. But I wanna to return to this question of spatial and temporal scales, because as I told you, well, maybe the scales don't matter. Maybe you don't have to worry about whether something is, what your definitions of close and far are. And what I wanna demonstrate with you at the very end here is that yes, maybe spatial and temporal scales don't matter. But if you take the data and you do not filter it, so that you can see the bounds of these means in, in blue over here, of the unfiltered data set. So if we just did the same bootstrap resampling, but we just had never taken out the things that were carbonates or not mudstones. And you'd see that uranium actually looks like it stayed fixed through time, not varied the way that you see it varying here. And so the take home here is that what's important isn't the, uh, isn't the, the spatial or temporal scale, it's actually the filtering. You guys lost uh, power or? <laughs>
lights. Well, we almost made it. Hi, Akshay. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. We, we just lost power in the room for a second, right at the end okay. of your... So maybe if you just want to summarize on my laptop. That everyone yeah. Wants... Oh, yeah, this is the last slide, so perfect timing. Um, uh, I want to make just two really, really quick points, and then uh, if you all have questions. But I just want to point out that large data sets can tell us compelling stories. But the important thing here is that we are not going to be able to AI and ML and co compute our way out of the bigger issue that we have in earth sciences, which is we just need more data. And so going out and measuring things, looking at rocks, compiling things, taking old records and, and, and putting them into databases, that's really the kind of work that we have to push right now. Because yes, bootstrap resampling and AI ML approaches and scraping will do a lot for us. But what we cannot get rid of is the fact that we have these large data gaps in, in, in Earth history. And the only way we get around that is by actually going out and doing geology. So yeah, with that, I just want to point out that this is work that's been done with a bunch, bunch of people. And um, yeah, I'll take any questions if you have them. Uh, thanks, Akshay. Sorry, man. Well, you're, you're getting a... Um example of the electricity <laughs> situation in South Africa right now. Um, I have a question. I don't know if anybody else has any questions, but uh, uh, we've got one. Let me ask mine first quickly. Uh, what do you think we can make from the, the, there seems to be a little change in the uranium concentration yeah. in mudstones at the GOE, but it's pretty unremarkable, right? Yeah, and I think like, you know, one thing you and I have talked about a bunch is, well, we kind of just need more data here, right? The biggest issue, and, and Eric's talked about this a lot, is we really need to densify stuff that's going out deeper in time, right? Um, this is an issue with data availability. This isn't an issue with a method, you know? And, you know, yeah, we're always limited by the rock record, but I think there's a lot of stuff out there that we still should be measuring and adding, right? And I think... As we think as geologists, it's so important to be going out and, and looking and measuring things because that is the fundamental work that will enable these broader insights over time, right? Yeah. Cool. We had a question. Maybe just say, yeah, maybe you want to come up. I've got a few questions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, thanks for the nice talk. Um, so question number one. Are you going to ever do serial sectioning through a chancel orid as well? Because they're like also weirdos of the Cambrian. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. Yeah, so I've become somewhat interested. We, we started thinking about the, about the weird stuff that exists at the Cambrian. I started looking at small shellies. That's the first example of that. And, you know, these are open questions I would love to work on. I just haven't had time to do. But, you know, part of this is, as you might be able to tell from the talk is I just need to go out and actually, or someone needs to go out and also do the sort of careful sedimentological work as well. Right. So, so a lot of this is also paleo environmental context and getting oriented samples, but I would absolutely love to look at more than just the, the late Ediacarans, right. Um, and, or the three that have been described. All right. And then um, uh, in periods of post uh, metazoan uh, reef collapse, so like the end of the late Devonian and then moving yeah. from the, from a triasic. Do you have, have you noticed any sort of, are there any similarities between those Kelsey microbial type biomes and Ediacaran biomes? Yeah, that is a fantastic question. And it's something that I'm actively very interested in. So I, I'm interested in looking from two directions, right? The first thing is, what does the morphology of pre metazone reef systems actually look like? And so that's work that I was able to secure a grant for. And so Really, the goal here is to just say, oh, what are the morphological features of things where we know that all we have are calcium microbial uh, organisms, right? And then to compare them to what does it look like when you go to the canning basin and you have the collapse? What is the morphological uh, signature there? And does that match what we see in the Proterozoic? Or is it really something totally different? Because at this point, there's all this other stuff that's happening on the planet, right? Um, I think those are very, very important questions. And people have really gotten to questions about what does reef morphology look like in the last you know, few tens of millions of years or even shorter. I think we have to go back into deep time as well. <laughs>
Okay. And then my last well, uh, question is, um, I noticed on your graph that the uranium concentrations and mudstones, uh, these seem to be sort of form these particular peaks. And what's interesting is that some of those peaks are tied to mudstone factory time. So, of course, uh, the Siberia of Devonian onwards is one of these. Um, and then those, I saw those other two peaks over there. Could they be tied to the Great Oxidation event and then something at 3.5? What, what, what is that? Yeah, I that's see. a fantastic question. I think, I think you're absolutely right that the stuff, especially when we were looking at the right side of this graph, are, are probably linked to very specific events. The, the one caution, and France is a push back against this, and I think is actually very valid, is that this is really a North American data set. So I think that's part of the reason uh, it requires a little bit more scrutiny, especially as we go further back in time. That I think is especially important, right? Um, because we just don't have enough data there. I don't know if that 3.5 is because we're looking at one or two examples, and we haven't really drilled into this, where you just have anomalously high uranium. You know, there are all these stories about whiffs, but the whiffs don't go back that far. So I, I think there, there are a lot of open questions still. And, and this goes back to the point of we need more data. All right, cool. Thanks very much. Talk. Yeah, for sure. And we had uh, Lou Eshwal was going to ask something. I have to go to the microphone. No, no, no. no. You, can, you can talk on the laptop. Okay. okay. Hey, you look much prettier. You look close up than far away. <laughs> You too. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Look, my 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 question is much less fantastic than Professor Cameron, uh, because I'm ignorant of this stuff. But um, uh, I think what I heard you say in the beginning of your talk is that uh, things like stromatolites only started building reef structures at around the time of the Ediacaran, uh, and it re it reminds me of a I have a field trip someone took me on many years ago where I was taken to a place uh, in South Africa about, about one day's drive to the west of here where I witnessed the most amazing stromatolites that you can ever imagine. If you haven't been there, you've got to go there. But to me, these stromatolites, which are, I can't remember the age, but they, they may have been uh, at least early Proterozoic, if not Archean. But anyway... These stromatolites were not building reef structures. They were building the New York City of stromatolites. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, so absolutely. You tell me that, that stromatolites only started making big structures around, uh, you know, around the Ediacaran. Yeah, I, I think, so a clarifying point there. Um, what I was saying was that calcifying metazoan, so animals started building reefs around uh, the Cambrian radiation. Stromatolites have been building reefs since 3.5, 3. you know, so... Stromatolites are the dominant form of, of reef builder leading right up to the, the Cambrian radiation, right? Um, and you're absolutely right. Like if you go to the Little Doll Reef, if you go to, right, a lot of these uh, neoperzoic, perzoic, Archean uh, stromatolite systems, these really are true reefs. I, I, I do believe that. So I think just a clarification there. Um, but no, it, I think they do absolutely amazing things. The, the fundamental question then we're after is what, what can we learn about the way that life may have evolved in these, are these also cradles of evolution as, um, as some people might say about modern reef systems. So. Great, thanks. Uh, we had one from Sue. You get to like a real close up. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's kind of a technical question, but on, for example, on your granite um, cross sections, I mean, yeah. one of the big problems we have is is distinguishing individual crystals of the same type next to each other. And are you, <laughs> are you <laughs> you're shaking your head? Are you winning with that, or is that something you're still struggling with? Because uh, you know, it's hard to tell on your three color diagram there. If, the, yeah. if that's a problem or not. Cause we're, I mean, we're also experimenting with this and I use a lot on, um, in the past I've used neutron tomography and which is, you know, slightly different physical property that it's looking at. And, and we still struggle with that, but we have some it's really good, sorry. It's non-destructive. It, it's also non-destructive. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I, I think, so that's a fantastic question. It is one of sort of grain finding and boundary finding is one of the open challenges in machine learning and AI. And I think no one's really answered that question well. 
you, you'll see these papers where they say, oh, I've sort of sort of figured this out. And then you actually look at the, once you start looking at their classifications, you're like, oh, actually you have not. Um, this is something I'm trying to push. We have a, you know, we have a bunch of AI experts here and I'm trying to push someone in, in CS or, or someone else to, to work with me on doing this boundary finding because that's really where we're down to at this point. Um, and, you know, I think as, I think I've mentioned this before, these are all complementary processes. So really, you can also almost break these down into two different steps. The first step is collecting the data. The second step is analyzing the data or, or segmenting it. And, and so what I'm hopeful is, is we can find as a community a set of uh, prescriptions that might allow us to apply to not just true color imagery, but to X-ray CT, to neutron tomography and stuff. And, you know, I think the key portion here is actually now just building good training sets. And so just having either having good tracing done or, or finding things where we know we know those boundaries really well. Um, but if as human beings, we can tell two things apart, that is a solvable problem. It's just how far are we from actually solving it, right? I think that's the where I come down on that. Any, it's a any great question. Different lighting in terms of like polarized light or yeah, okay. Yeah, so we are at the point now where, so the machine, I'm, I'm trying to write a grant to build one of these machines here. And I use reflected light now. So we have eight wavelengths of light. So we go from UV all the way to IR and the UV helps a ton, right? And people know this already, um, but it's, the idea is then we actually just look at specific channels of reflected light, which is much more powerful, right? Even when we think about fossils, UV does really good fossils that have appetite in them fluoresce beautifully. And so you can start to do some really good work of finding boundaries that way as well. Um, but no, multi, multi-channel imaging is, is a critical way to go about it. Um, I think Jim Schiffbauer does interesting work. I think the neutron tomography work that you're mentioning, you can get past some of these material contrast issues doing really, like there are ways around it. And, and then we get in the space of field of view, right, is a big issue as well. So, you know, the samples that we're looking at are five centimeters by five centimeters, all the way to 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. So we're looking at large volumes, which are great for fracture networks. Maybe not necessarily when you're looking at a tiny fossil, right? So there's that as well. Great. Thanks. If there's no other questions, let's everybody say thanks. Akshay. Hi. Yeah, I thank you. But I'll email. Yeah, of course. Okay. No, I've had this for a while and no one's given me a chance. Um, oh, Corin, Corin, sorry. I didn't see your hand. Oh, my God. I even texted Brian just to be like, hey, guys, like, I have a question. Let <laughs> um, me just put my video on. Hi, I really enjoyed your talk. And I was um, actually more interested in the, the first half of your talk and the device that you were talking about. And yeah. I was thinking about some potential applications of that and um, potentially for zircons and for diamond work. And but it would require some modification if you would be interested in adding a cathodoluminescence detector um, to the imaging device. Because um, I was thinking, for example, for zircons, where you're um, um, putting laser UPB spots on zones of different luminescence, um, well, that's just on that one surface. But then if you could do the cathodoluminescence imaging in sections, obviously on a piece of on a mineral that you've already done the analytical work that you want to do because you're going to be destroying it. But yeah. what I was thinking is that, you know, like on the section that you've, you've now zapped it, you've got your data that you want, then afterwards destroy it and then see where those zones go in three dimensions through the crystal. And then potentially you can model the ages of the average age of the crystal through the whole mineral, right? That's, or yeah. you can potentially model how much of the crystal is this, for example, 3GA zone. Um, so that's the one application that I was thinking. And then another one was for diamond work, where we also do um, cathode luminescence imaging in diamonds. Uh, we're less keen to destroy all of the diamond than we are zircons, which are we don't care about as much. <laughs> um, but, you know, for, for diamond work as well, uh, we do cathode luminescence imaging to see uh, growth zones, but also deformation features. Um, and so then once again, if you could model the cathode luminescence zones in three dimensions throughout the crystal, I think that would be a very um, interesting application of 
of that device that you were showing um, in the first half of the talk? Yeah, absolutely. And I think there are ways to do this where we don't even need the full device, right? So I've thought about this a lot. One thing we've started thinking about are 3D geochemistry through things in a similar way, right? Where we're interested in, we have these microbial constructions. People say that they initiate in a high magnesium clay. Can we see signals of magnesium changing as you go through the sample? And so what that involves is you grind away some material, you then take it over to a Raman or you take it over to a XRF, you do a scan, you go through more material. And so I think in your specific application, actually, this is a pretty totally solvable one, right? Where we have a CL set up and all we have to do is actually just build a little uh, system to make sure that we only remove a certain amount of material and that we have registration marks. And if we have those three things, we should be able to do this pretty easily. And yeah. so the, the trick actually becomes, uh, and one thing we ran into here is how do we make sure that we have a good feedback between the imaging and then the, the sort of dating or whatever else. And so I think if we could come up with a system like that, it might just be, oh, actually here's the add-on for the CL system you already have because you're also measuring this, you know, you're measuring these ages in-house as well. And so like, actually this is all you have to really do. And then you just grind away and then I can show you how to do the registrations, but this might just require a very small device that you kind of, it's just a little fix on top of like a grinding plate. And so that you can just make sure you control it to be whatever you're going down like a few microns at a time. I think that would be a fascinating application. That is a space where people have not actually gotten to yet, which is 3D geochemistry. And I think those are questions that really would require a whole set of these different tools to, to do. I think they were trying to do something like that with the atom probe. Um, yes, yeah. Three-dimensional UPB ages or some three-dimensional uh, geochemistry. But I think, um, well, I work on diamonds, not on zircons. And so I know for, for diamonds, atom probe had has limited applications at the moment. Um, yeah, and so I was just yeah, curious um, how easy it would be to adapt the system. Yeah. I think potentially easier for zircons than for diamonds because for diamonds, you'd need a diamond embedded something to, to grind away. So it would yeah. potentially be more difficult to actually grind the diamond away. But I, I'd definitely be keen to chat to you more about this and yeah. see if interesting, um, interesting applications that, that we can work on. Yeah, absolutely. I would love that. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Sure? Thanks. Thanks, Karen. And uh, Akshay, thank you, guys. Thank you, uh, Akshay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>